Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining me as we talk about COVID-19 here in Erie County. But before we get started on the COVID-19 report, I'm going to make my final announcement about the importance of the 2020 census. Census workers have been out in our community working to close the gap between self-response and a complete count. Unfortunately, their time has now been cut short. As things are ever changing, the United States Supreme Court ruled just yesterday to wrap up the 2020 census efforts by 6 a.m. Friday. That is less than 48 hours away. If you have not had the opportunity to be counted, we ask you to hurry and respond online at my2020census.gov or by calling 844-330-2020 today. The response rates here in Erie County are at 73% and within the city of Erie, it sits at 65%. All mailed in responses must be postmarked by tomorrow, October 15th. You're also invited to join us at a census celebration event tomorrow at the Quality of Life Learning Center and that'll be at 12.15 till 2 o'clock. Uh, this event is open to the public. It will include opportunities to complete your census there as well as there will be some prizes and free ice cream from the Straw Hat Sunday Shop out of Northeast. And now for today's COVID update. We have 17 new cases to report as of late last evening, which brings us to a total of 1,826 cumulative positive cases since March. 173 cases are currently active, 1,600 cases have recovered, and there are 53 deaths reported in the NEDS data system. Of the cumulative cases in Erie County, 56% are female and 44% are male. In regards to the ethnicity and race of our total cumulative cases, we have 65% being white residents, 18% African American black residents, 7% Asian residents, 2% other, and 7% are unknown. Regarding Hispanic origin, 6% are Hispanic of any race, 82% are not Hispanic, and 12% are unknown. And as always, please remember that sometimes our percentages don't add up to 100 due to rounding. The breakdown of the total cases by age in the last seven days to show you the trends is uh, what I'm going to talk about next, but know that you can find the full cumulative list on eriecountypa.gov. But in the last seven days, 3% have been ages 0 to 4, 2% ages 5 to 9, 16% ages 10 to 18, 21% ages 19 to 24, 34% ages 25 to 49, 14% ages 50 to 64, and 10% are ages 65 or older. So as you can see this week, the highest percentage of cases falls in the 25 to 49 age group with only 24 in that 50 and up. So the virus continues to search for its next host and often these days that seems to be in our younger population. But please be responsible and mindful of those who are most vulnerable of your loved ones in our community. We ask you to remember the elderly, remember those who are immunocompromised. And this virus doesn't really uh, care, it's just looking for its next victim. So we ask you to wear your mask, we ask you to keep your distance from others, wash your hands frequently, get a flu shot for sure this year, and stay home if you are feeling at all ill. And now I'm going to invite Melissa Lyon, the director of the Erie County Department of Health, to share an update from the health department. Melissa. Thank you, County Executive, and it's always a pleasure to be here on the press conferences weekly when I'm available. My update today is to talk about uh, the increase in cases that we are seeing across the community. Um, I was asked earlier in the week, maybe it was uh, end of last week, if I was disappointed or surprised with the case increases. And, and I'm neither disappointed nor surprised, it was expected. When we get back to doing the social activities that we enjoy, and uh, those have um, occurred around university activities, high school, middle school activities, 
just as well as just social events that we enjoy, especially with this lovely fall weather. So I wanted to take a moment and really stress some very important pieces when we're being socially uh, active and interacting with others. So we have a couple of examples, and these are real life examples, that I won't be giving the details of the locations or the individuals or the school districts, but I'm going to talk about the importance of uh, staying in quarantine and remaining in isolation uh, in a couple of different scenarios. And I'll give you the outcomes of what's happened when individuals don't do that. So for example, when someone has been sent for testing, it is so important that they remain in a self-isolation until those test results come back. Someone has been required to get testing because they've either been a contact of a known positive, uh, have been exposed, or are symptomatic. Uh, they have some sort of high risk factor that identifies them as potentially COVID-19 positive. So while you're awaiting test results, it's so important that you stay in self-isolation until those test results come back. An example is an individual that would have been waiting for test results attended at a social event. And during that social event exposed a number of people because they did not wait for the test results. When the test result came back positive, they also attended a second social event thinking that their symptoms had resolved and that they were no longer contagious. So out of one individual attending two social events, this was 16 people that are now in quarantine and this has affected four separate schools. A second event is where two individuals that uh, did not know that they were infectious but attended a very um, closely connected event uh, where they were all 10 attendees were in a very close contact with one another. Eight of the 10 attendees became positive and this has resulted in infecting uh, others at a school and also has gone into a healthcare facility. I'm just giving these examples because I want everyone to really understand that while these are our recommendations and the requirements, it's so important because there are these results that come out of that, whether it is additional quarantine or it goes into a school district, it goes to a teacher, it goes home to another family, it impacts healthcare workers. This can happen so quickly within 14 days. If we just take a moment really focus on the importance of doing the self-isolation uh, and quarantine, we're going to stop the spread of the disease. If we do not heed this advice, the disease is going to quickly overwhelm our community and we're going to be in a place that's just very devastating for the, the what could come next. And I, and I don't want us to get there. I know we can do a good job. We've done this in the past. I'm asking everyone, please, 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 when you're together, wear your masks. Don't stay in close, close proximity for long periods of time. Keep those visits very brief. We need to keep the contacts down to a very minimum if possible. I know we're tired. I know COVID has made us all tired. We are fatigued with the requirements. We're, re we're fatigued with the message. But I'm really asking that you, as a citizen of Erie County, do your best to follow our recommendations and requirements, as well as masking and social distancing. Thank you, and I look forward to taking questions when the time comes. Thank you so much, Director Lyons. It's a very sobering um, message, but it's a really important message. Earlier today, I was on uh, watching Dr. Levine, the Secretary of the Department of Health from the state, speak, and she said, it really is up to the residents of the Commonwealth and I agree, and I'll say here in Erie County, it's really up to you, the residents of Erie County, uh, how things go as we move forward uh, in this pandemic. So thank you for all that you have continued to do in this community to try to stop the spread. And please remember, we all need to be extra vigilant, particularly at this time as we see our numbers rising. So yesterday, I voted by mail. I placed my ballot in the drop box outside of the Erie County Courthouse. And confirmation has come saying the ballot was received and recorded. It was safe and it was easy. So I thought it would be appropriate to invite the chair of the election board, Carl Anderson, to join us today to share the safety measures that the election board has put in place for election day 
with the COVID-19 pandemic in mind. Carl? County Executive Doug Camper, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, I do want to thank your administration for all the work that they're doing uh, with the election department, uh, particularly with uh, Tanya Fernandez and Doug Smith and uh, those uh, folks in your uh, administration, uh, Brad Hirschman and Dale Robertson and, and Melissa Dixon and so, so many others uh, who have been uh, working tirelessly to ensure that uh, Erie County is safe, uh, but that the uh, election day and the, the polling sites will be safe. And uh, so we, we can be uh, gratified to know uh, that we have people who care and people who are wear, working very diligently uh, on this issue on behalf of the citizens of Erie County. Uh, so, uh, you know, October 19th is the last day to register to vote and uh, October 27th uh, is the last day to ask for uh, uh, a, an absentee ballot or a mail-in ballot. Um, those ballots that are mailed in and postmarked by November 3rd uh, will be accepted up until November 6th and still be counted. Uh, as you said, uh, you know, we, we'd have placed a, a drop box uh, in front of the courthouse. Uh, Erie County was the, the first a county in Pennsylvania to uh, institute a drop box uh, actually before COVID happened, but uh, it, it has become certainly an important part of the election uh, process since COVID has happened. Uh, it's working well, uh, but uh, at the same time, we will have uh, all 149 voting precincts open in 123 locations. And uh, all of those have undertaken uh, strict policies and procedures to ensure uh, that they're clean and safe for all of the people that choose to come in and vote on election day. Uh, so uh, there, there will be hand sanitizer. Uh, the uh, uh, poll workers will uh, be wearing gloves. They will have face masks. Um, they, they will make sure that uh, the tables are cleaned and uh, the, the voting areas are clean uh, after each person votes, uh, that the pens are cleaned uh, after each person votes. Uh, we are encouraging people uh, and allowing them to bring their own uh, blue or black pen in with them uh, on election day if they would uh, choose to do that. Um, there will certainly be wipes there and we'll uh, have a cup there to uh, move the clean pens uh, to a, a, a used area uh, until they're able to be cleaned. Uh, so, uh, you know, we are uh, taking uh, extra precautions uh, this year, uh, as you guys have stated, uh, you know, so eloquently earlier, uh, the importance of uh, how we come together as a community and uh, respect each other and respect the space of each other uh, to ensure that we can control this pandemic. Uh, we're doing all that we can uh, on the election board uh, to do that. And uh, I certainly uh, want to thank uh, Vice Chair uh, Mary Rennie, uh, who has uh, been working tirelessly as well in this process, and, and all of our colleagues on the election board. Thank you, uh, Carl. And as uh, Councilman Anderson indicated, um, I think the um, residents of this community can be well assured and pleased that county government is working collectively to keep you safe in so many ways, and particularly around this very, very important election that is only uh, less than three weeks away and the election board and all of those in uh, the voter registration office, the election office have been working very, very diligently. They have a lot of work ahead of them in the next few weeks, uh, but know that they are there to serve all of you. So thank you, um, Councilman Anderson for coming on with me today. I'm just gonna recap a little bit about the CARES Act funding uh, that we dispersed or that is getting dispersed as we speak and was announced last week. Uh, for the Nonprofit Assistant Grant Program, 104 organizations were granted $4.3 million. The grants range from $2,000 to $100,000 per organization. For the Erie County Care Small Business Assistant Grant, 181 small businesses were granted $5.7 million, and those grants ranged from $5,000 to $75,000. 
The municipal reimbursement program, um, 17 municipalities were reimbursed and they received just under 400,000. And the reimbursement requests ranged from 445 to 200,000. And that's a reimbursement program, so they supplied us with what their costs were and then we reimbursed. And for the Erie County CARES personal protection equipment uh, for small businesses program, we had 85 applicants. They're receiving 118 of these, what we call PPE kits and applicants uh, were, will be contacted by the Public Safety Department shortly to schedule the pickup of that kit. All these awardees have been notified and a second round will open soon for our nonprofits, for the PPE kits and municipalities. So those details, as soon as we have them pulled together, will be sent out so that uh, those entities will know they can apply for further funding. Please remember when the second round does open up, that we need all applicants to meet all eligibility requirements, which were set forward by the federal government and the state government, and to submit all their documentation. Make sure that you fill out everything that's requested on that application. So thank you to everyone who took the time to complete this application process, and congratulations to all those awardees. We hope that it helps you somehow uh, make it through this pandemic in at least a little bit easier way. And now we're going to open it up to the media for questions. And today we're going to start with Erie News Now. Thank you, Kathy. This is Paul Wagner. I had a question for Melissa Lyon. Uh, Melissa, la late last week you and I talked. Uh, you said that your contact tracers were really exhausted from the, the recent resurgence. Uh, what's that situation now? And uh, have you contacted Harrisburg for any additional help? Uh, nice to hear from you, Paul, and uh, we did have a conversation around the the exhaustion that, that's just happening at the health department overall, and in particular around contact tracing. I think the examples that I provided to you uh, clearly describe, um, you know, the number of contacts is pretty significant now as we're being uh, more social in our, in our movements. So, uh, as far as reaching out to Harrisburg for uh, assistance, I, the state has put together regional uh, contact tracing leads, and so we work closely with our regional contact tracing lead. Um, we have not yet had to ask for regional assistance. Uh, if I were to make that determination to request regional assistance, um, you know, there's a, it's, a, it's very quick. It would be a, a phone call and discussions on what capacity is available. Um, so right now we're we're holding level. Uh, we're holding solid. Um, just send a lot of positive energy our way right now as as we're working through this. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, talk Erie, Joel. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Kathy. I appreciate uh, you calling on me. I want to ask a question of Melissa Lyon. Uh, Melissa, do you have any idea how long some of those patients that you talked about uh, that broke out of their isolation, how long were they waiting for test results? Thanks. That's a really good question as far as I think that is uh, uh, some of, some of the confusion is it's taking a long time for test results to come back. I don't know the specifics of each one of those cases that I presented to you today. However, we have seen uh, the average turnaround time from three to five days. Uh, someone may actually wait to get their testing until they're, you know, fairly symptomatic. So they could be, you know, three to five days in their infectious period. It takes three to five days to get a turnaround time. If you think about it, when the test result comes back, if they're no longer symptomatic, they could be coming out of isolation the day we call them, the day after we call them. So the turnaround time is a concern. Um, it's just going to require a robust national strategy to increase the testing capacity across this country. And so uh, we will work within the parameters that we have. Just a quick follow-up, uh, referring back to what Dr. Nadwarney has told us. Do you, are you hearing anything from the state health department regarding uh, boosting the capacity of the state labs uh, to actually, you know, for Pennsylvania to really step up when it comes to testing? We have not heard specifically that the state health department has a uh, coordinated effort to increase testing. Uh, there had been dollars spent for the Walmarts and the CVSs to be uh, testing sites, and 
in all honesty, the numbers that we saw at those testing sites were not as high as we would have liked to have seen. And if you can think about the different types of barriers that may be in place for testing, uh, so for example, if it's from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, that may not be adequate time. If it's a drive up only, you don't have a car, that's not appropriate. So there are additional barriers in some of the uh, testing strategies that have been put uh, put forward. Uh, and I know Harrisburg and Pennsylvania Department of Health are aware of those. We communicate regularly. So um, with that being said, if they have the ability to make uh, concerted efforts to improve the testing across the Commonwealth, I am confident that they would be able to do so. Uh, I'm just not sure that, that they have quite the, the power that we would like them to have around that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jet TV. Good afternoon, this is Star. This question is for Melissa Lyon in regards to the increase in cases of the coronavirus. Any pullback on telling these municipalities not to have Halloween as you're seeing them, um, like you said earlier, different situations of multiple people being quarantined? Thank you. Uh, so I still stand fairly strong on my um, recommendation that I'm confident that if well ex executed, uh, Halloween can occur safely with the appropriate modifications. And we've shared that with the municipalities, you know, such as um, having the treats displayed on tables where individuals self-serve one at a time, masking, not gathering. Um, where we're seeing the increased cases are when the event is not following the guidance, when people are not masking, when people are staying within six feet or closer for 15 minutes or more, sometimes multiple hours. Um, it's really when they're being non-compliant with the recommendations that we're seeing the increased cases. And it's to be expected, uh, you know, fatigue is setting in and I, I can't stress that enough. I truly am empathetic with the fatigue that everyone is feeling around COVID-19. Myself included, I have to have reminders, like put your mask on, you know, wear your mask continuously, don't become complacent. And so that's my message is if, if and when you're having to socialize, do your due diligence and, and wear your mask and, and keep a social distance. And, and I know it's tough, I really do. I hope that answers your, your question, Star. Thanks. Um, I'm just gonna add one thing to that. I've seen something on um, the internet. It's kind of cute. You get a PVC pipe and you put it on your railing at your house and you can drop the candy in the top and have the kid put their bag at the bottom and deliver the candy without uh, touching each other. So um, you can find that on the internet. There's, I've seen it in a number of places. So people are trying to be inventive and uh, still follow the guidelines. And my fear is if we don't have trick-or-treating, will people just have house parties instead? And of course that would be much more, I think, dangerous if putting people inside of a building, inside of even a garage, close together for a long period of time, as uh, Melissa Lyon has explained. Let's go to Erie Times News. Hi, Kathy, it's David. This question is both for you and, and Melissa. I want to follow up a little bit on these, these small household gatherings. The CDC said you know, they are primarily to blame for this surge we're seeing across, the, across much of the country. Um, how, you know, other than education, is there anything that can be done? How, can, can, is there any way to enforce these to be done either not at all or done with the right protocols? Um, legally, I don't believe we have any way to enforce that, David. I think that uh, we have to really rely on the residents of Erie County to do the right thing and to understand the dangers of their actions. You know, we're coming out of summer. During the summertime, maybe your neighbor would come over and sit in your yard in a lawn chair, and uh, you'd have a mask on, hopefully, be six feet apart, hopefully, but even if you maybe didn't do that, the wind was blowing, and the risk is, as we know, much less outside. So now, people are, it's cold, getting colder, people are moving inside, and uh, we've gotten used to maybe again socializing after a number of months of a stay-at-home order. And I think that's part of the, the danger of us having become maybe a bit complacent over the summer when we could do outdoor activities much more frequently. But I'm going to see if Melissa has anything to add to that in terms of the enforcement. That's correct, County Executive. We really don't have a, a mechanism for enforcement. Uh, people can 
um, have a gathering and they can uh, be social and and to be honest I, I I know the importance of that and I think that there are really good reasons why cho people are choosing to socialize because we know that the uh, isolation and the seclusion is is just as harmful to our health so as this is beginning to happen I say to myself um, that I'd like to share please choose a space that's big enough to accommodate those that you are inviting uh, so that you can be spread out six feet. Please consider the activity that you're going to partake in. We know that uh, consuming alcohol tends to uh, lower your, your, um, your inhibitions and then your, you talk louder. Um, so I've said these things before and I'm just really reinforcing the concept of if you're going to do it, plan appropriately. Um, do have masks available. Uh, maybe not share a meal. Uh, keep the time frame shorter than you normally would. Uh, we just have to make a lot of accommodations, and um, and I, I do empathize with all of those that are having to go through this. So thanks, David, but there's not an enforcement strategy. We're going to go right. back Thank to you. Thank you both. Uh, we'll go back to Erie News now. Uh, Kathy, you mentioned that you watched uh, Dr. Levine, uh, her remarks from Harrisburg today. She said because of the 1,000 cases a day, day after day, she uh, is worried that there's now a fall resurgence statewide. Uh, can we use that same characterization, would you say, for Erie County because of the double-digit counts we've had day after day? Uh, do you see a fall resurgence and more worry? Well, I certainly am more worried as I see these numbers climb quite significantly from where they were just a few weeks ago. Um, I'll let Melissa address whether it's a true fall resurgence or not. I'm not quick to jump on a, um, you know, a, a categorization of what's really happening or a, a buzz term of a fall resurgence. I, I am concerned about the numbers. One thing that was uh, discussed today on our call statewide is that everywhere across the state we are seeing this increase. So if you wanted to categorize from a state perspective, it, it, it would look like we have a resurgence. We definitely have an uptick. Um, we're all falling behind in case investigations and, and data collection and, and um, uh, data reporting. And so this is a concern. Um, I anticipate we'll see a few more weeks of this and um, it, it's to be expected as we're being um, more socially engaged in our activities. So um, a fall resurgence, if Dr. Levine says that's the case, then she's the expert. Thank you. Talk Erie. Thank you. Joel? Yes, hi. Uh, here's a question for uh, Councilman um, Anderson. Uh, Carl, what's safer, uh, standing in line at the courthouse to vote early or waiting till election day and voting at your precinct? Well, uh, both are going to be equally safe. Uh, uh, however, for many people, uh, it may be more convenient for them uh, to use the drop box, uh, and they may personally feel uh, more secure uh, by by being able to uh, go to the drop box and and not have uh, you know others around them or have to wait in line. But uh, the polling uh, precincts uh, will will be safe. They will be clean. Uh, they will have uh, uh, the accessibility to continue to clean throughout the day. Uh, I should say that uh, in most cases, uh, you know, bathrooms will be closed in facilities, uh, particularly to those uh, who are not working the polls. Uh, and many of the kitchens uh, that would normally be used uh, as some areas have bake sales and things of that nature, uh, they will more than likely be closed as well. Um, so there, you know, there will be some uh, changes to, uh, the, you know, the normal uh, uses of the facilities that we're in, uh, but that uh, is is to ensure the uh, the safety of the people who are coming in to vote. But just to be clear, to use the drop box, you would have already had to receive your proper ballot, which would which would take filling out the form and getting that in and so on, right? Correct. You have until uh, October twenty seventh uh, to to apply, and then. Uh, to, to apply for the ballot and then receive it and have it returned by uh, postmark by uh, November 3rd. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. I, I will say for anyone who does come to the Erie County Courthouse, we have a great procedure um, as people come in. 
So our sheriff's deputies ask people why they're coming, um, if they have a reason to be in the courthouse or not. So we do limit the people coming in. But of course, if anyone's coming in to uh, go apply uh, to register to vote or to get their absentee ballot or to actually uh, deliver their ballot, they are welcome to come into the courthouse. The uh, sheriff's deputies will actually say there's a drop box right there if you'd like to just drop it off. And I saw that happen yesterday and the woman said, oh, and she didn't know it. She went over to the drop box, put it in there. But if she had preferred to go take it and hand it in to the election office, then she would be allowed to do that. And the election office, as every other place in the courthouse is doing, uh, has it marked out so that everyone stays six feet apart and the social distancing does happen. And you're absolutely required to wear a mask when you are in the Erie County Courthouse. So safe there, safe when you get to the polls. Um, and I thank you know, the, the elections office for doing such a great job with, with those uh, issues. Uh, Jet TV. This question is for Councilman Anderson. Carl, what are we doing to make sure people are staying socially distant at the polls when it hits that rush hour after work for those that are going to work and want to come in person afterwards to make sure their uh, vote gets counted? Yeah, so I, I should mention that, um, you know, we anticipate about 45% of the electorate who's going to vote will vote uh, by mail or absentee ballot, uh, meaning that there'll be about 55% of the people uh, who still will choose to go to the polls. So, uh, you know, we're asking people to understand, uh, you know, the circumstances that we're in, to be patient, uh, to, uh, you know, be courteous to each other, uh, to keep those uh, social distances. In, in some uh, cases, the uh, voting precincts are uh, you know, rather tight. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're going to have to have, uh, you know, heightened uh, awareness of everybody in those particular instances. Uh, but we'll, uh, you know, have marks uh, on the floor to, to keep that distance. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll have uh, separations uh, at the tables where uh, people are voting. Uh, so they'll be able to keep socially distanced in, in uh, those cases as well. Thanks. Thank you, Star. Um, Erie Times News, David? Yes, Kathy, this is for Melissa. I want to go back to this fall resurgence that Dr. Levine mentioned earlier today. Um, whether we call it a resurgence here in Erie County or an uptick in cases, it certainly seems like there's some differences from from the earlier surges we saw in the, in the late spring and summer. Melissa, how, how is this one different? What have you seen how this one differs from the previous ones in the county. Yeah, so each time we've seen an increase in cases, it's had to do with different events uh, or testing patterns. So I'll, I'll do a compare and contrast. For example, it was required that all long-term care facilities uh, do robust testing in a very rapid and short period of time, which was really well designed because we identified a lot of cases of COVID-19 and we were able to uh, work with those facilities to uh, contain disease. So that's one example. Uh, this one makes good sense because universities are back in session and schools are, many of them are doing a hybrid model, which is some uh, in-person learning and some rem remote learning. Uh, and this is not to uh, criticize universities and school districts for taking the steps to make those decisions because they have very uh, have done a very good job planning for bringing students um, back into the classroom. Uh, what actually is happening is we're seeing that there are social activities surrounding that type of facility. So for example, if there's a sporting event, while we may not see cases of uh, athletes getting uh, transmission because they're playing the sport against another team, it's when spectators are coming, uh, when they're planning their meals, how they're going to transport the athletes from different games. It's that type of interaction that's causing the increase in cases and then we're seeing household contacts also becoming positive. So I hope that that gives you an example. It is to be expected, and this isn't unusual. It just changes the dynamics of where the virus has found its foothold, for lack of better words, and how it's spreading within the activities that individuals are partaking in. I hope that's helpful, David. Yeah, and let me just follow up, Melissa, with a question on this. Um, you know, we're three weeks into this this surge and we still haven't seen an increase in hospitalizations. 
Is there some comfort that it looks like that these cases are not getting spread in the numbers we feared to older people who are more likely to get complications that lead to hospitalization? I'd like to put myself in the bucket of I don't want to do any predictions that we might not see that in the future. I think it's reassuring that disease has not resulted in high numbers of hospitalizations, but I think that could change at, at any moment. I don't want to be the one that speculates or predicts when and where and why that would happen. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Paul for Erie News Now, do you have a final question? No, I, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, talk Erie, Joel, do you have a final question? Just, just a quick one for you, Kathy. Is there any talk uh, from the state about counties going back to yellow or red, or has that whole um, method of the, the traffic lights been abandoned? I haven't heard of any plans uh, to reinstate uh, the red-yellow um, phase, as we saw in the springtime at this point. Uh, Jet TV star, do you have a final question? I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you. And back to you, David, for a final question, if you have one. Erie Times News. Yeah, uh, of course I do, Kathy. <laughs> um, I want one on the restaurants. I, I saw that we're up to about 182 restaurants that have filed for self-certification. Still, I know it, it's not a number I think that you were expecting to see. It, it's lower than that. Just want to get your thoughts on why relatively few restaurants have signed up for this and, and your thoughts you know, about the fact that, that we have only have 182 out of, what, almost 1,500 licensed facilities. Well, I'm not really sure why other restaurants have not done their self-certification, but I would say to all of those uh, watching and listening today that if you want to make sure that the restaurant you're going to has self-certified and is eligible then to move to 50% capacity, uh, they should have that posted on their front door. So when you walk to that restaurant and you see that certification, you'll know that they are in compliance. Um, so that's what I would do, I guess, if I was looking at that. I want to make sure the restaurant that I'm going to, if they've gone to 50 percent capacity, has done that. Now, if they stay at 25 percent capacity, they don't need to do that. So maybe as the weather changes, I'm just assuming, um, and more businesses can't have you eating outside any longer because up till now we've still been able to eat outside most of the time. Um, maybe we'll see more restaurants do that uh, process of self-certification, but I can't really uh, presume why they have not. Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you all uh, for being with me again, and I, and I just want to thank the media. I haven't thanked you in a while, but I do really appreciate your continued um, attention to the pandemic and helping us to get the message out in this way every single week. And so finally, I'm going to celebrate today's star player. It's a business who's doing things well, and that is the KC Ice Cream in Cory. They offer contactless pickup and separate order pickup windows. And an added bonus that I was excited to hear about is they are staying open throughout the winter this year, uh, which they don't normally do. So if you're down on Route 6 uh, near Cory, stop in and get an ice cream um, all year long. I want to thank our businesses for doing everything they can to possibly they can possibly do to keep us safe our businesses again have been great partners throughout this pandemic i want to ask all of you to consider going on the covid alert pa um, app on your phone we've had quite a few uh, pennsylvania residents get on that app it's a great way to be alerted if you've been near someone who is a positive and they also have had the app and that app is now working in some of the states around us and so it's a good way, again, to have that alert. Please look into that. I ask you, of course, to uh, do your social distancing. Stay six feet away from people that you do not live with. Wear a mask whenever you're outside of your home. Wash your hands frequently. Use hand sanitizer when you can't wash your hands. And throughout this pandemic, please try to stay as close as home as you can. Stay safe. And as always, please stay calm. Thank you.